So, let's see. Okay, I'm here with Steve Miller. Steve, how are you today, sir? Please introduce yourself for us. Uh, great to be here, Shay. Uh, yep. My name, as, as Shay said, Steve Miller. Yep. Previously, I was the video blogger known as the Chi Ranger. But these days, I am the anchor of the Voice of America's International Edition radio program at 1705 UTC. And I'm happy to be here on, on Shay's podcast. And while I'm representing myself and my own opinions, I do need to make the disclaimer that I am not representing the U.S. federal government, Voice of America, or the U.S. Agency for Global Media. But I am jazzed to be here and jazzed to talk to you today. Well, thank you. Thank you. So now, Steve, you... Uh... You used to live in Asia as well, correct? Yeah, so I lived in South Korea from 2008 up until 2016, specifically outside of Seoul, South Korea. I had the opportunity to travel around not only the Korean Peninsula, but throughout Southeast Asia and, of course, over to Japan uh, briefly for uh, a few trips. And I loved I really do miss being over on that side of the world and moved back to the States in 2016 and have been here pretty much ever since, except for uh, about a seven month stint back in, in 2018, where okay. I uh, was the interim director or not interim director, but interim bureau chief for the uh, Seoul Bureau for VOA. Okay. Okay. So what brought you originally to South Korea? Why did you choose South Korea? That's a great question. You know, um, so going back several years, um, when I was in college, I originally wanted to be a physician and then I hurt my knee and didn't like being in hospitals very much. So mm -hmm. I got involved with universities and university administration and wound up getting my master's of education. And for a number of years, I actually worked uh, for private and public education here in the United States. Uh, but I left that because in the United States, unfortunately, you know, education budgets were continuously being cut and there was less emphasis placed on what I feel is, you know, a really good, robust education and really teaching towards tests to secure funding, uh, at the state and, um, you know, federal levels in terms of what they could get for students. And it really wasn't part of the education that I wanted to do. So I left education in general and, you know, opened my own business and wound up selling that in 2007. And I was looking for something new to do. So since I had a master's in education and when I was working for the, uh, the university, a couple of my students were part of the JET program and wrote letters of recommendation for them. And so teaching English was always in the back of my mind. And I thought, well, hey, you know, I, 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 I like in, you know, teaching. I, I like being around students. Uh, I was always fascinated with Asia. And so I looked at various places to go. And at that time, uh, South Korea was one of the top places on my list to go because I didn't know very much about it. And I'm a student of history and like learning new things. Yeah. And they also had a really good package in terms of what they would afford teachers. So it was one of those things that just kind of fell together and brought me to, to South Korea in 2008. Well, nice. Yeah. That's, that's about the same year I came to Japan as well. Um, now, when you, you you started teaching uh, English in South Korea, right? Did you teach mm -hmm. for the school system, or did you teach uh, privately, or um, how how did you first enter into the field? Yeah, so uh, there are public education uh, positions out there, whether it be the Epic program or the Gepic program, or, or different educations. Uh, designed to support the public schools. I was teaching at Hogwans, which are after school academies. And I did that for about two and a half years. Uh, because of master's degree, I was able to get a university teaching position. So between 2008 and 2011, I was, I was teaching at the after school academy. And then mm -hmm. in 2011, up until the time I had left uh, Korea, I was teaching at universities. And okay. so, uh, both at private, well, I guess they were all private universities, but at different tiers as well. Um, you know, second and third tier universities. And then at one of the sky schools, Korea university, uh, which is the top tier university in, in South Korea. Right. Right. So when you, when you say you're teaching at, at universities, um, uh, the first thought that a lot of people I encounter at least, um, 
in in Japan is they say they teach at a university, but they're they're not a professor. They they teach. They're part of an English program at the university. Which were you part of something like that, or were you an, an actual like uh, tenured? Or, or well, was, I was not. I was. I was not tenured, and nor could I be in the tenure track. I was I yeah. part of. Uh, well, at one university, I was part of the liberal arts college, uh, teaching mandatory English classes for credit for credit hours that were required for graduation and, and students there, and okay. then. At the other university, I was part of the foreign language school, uh, which was a proper college within the university, much as if you were studying uh, Spanish or Japanese or Chinese here in the United States, you'd be part of like the liberal arts college or college of arts and sciences and, and take four credit college classes in a foreign language. And that's right. where I taught there. So these were all four credit classes that weren't part of like some uh, university-based academy program. Okay, okay. And you said you did that up until you left Korea. So pretty much your entire uh, stint in Korea was 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 doing this this job. You didn't uh, change, change around, do different things, correct? Uh, correct, yeah. So the, yeah. most of my time in, in South Korea, I was, my, my main job of, of course was, was teaching. So when I was teaching at the after school academy, I was teaching between 20 and 24 hours a week and okay. teaching at the university. The, the basic teaching load was 15 hours a week, but there are semesters where it was closer to 18 to 20 hours a week uh, that we were teaching classes there. And depending on the university, they're either once a week classes where you meet for two, two and a half hours, or you would have three classes a week where the classes were, you know, an hour per lesson, but you'd meet the students three times a week to break up that three hours. I but see. I would do, I, I, I did that for 2011 up until 2016 and then the other, uh, 2008 to 2011. So right. pretty, pretty good run there. Yeah. And then on top of that, on top of that, I, I, I did the YouTube thing. I, I, I did yeah. uh, radio and TV in South Korea as well. So it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Okay. So let, let's go in that direction then. So uh, let's start by YouTube first. Um, what got you interested into YouTube and what kind of uh, content did you put out for those unfamiliar with, with uh, your, your old channel? Yeah. So when I was in uh, the United States, uh, you know, I was an old time blogger, grew up with the Internet when it first came out and you know, mm -hmm. did distance learning uh, management uh, when I was in college and, and you know, was was with the first, I would say, cadre of of distributed learning universities in the U.S., uh, working with a lot of different professors and a lot of different professionals trying to get things going. Uh, and so I always had uh, either an online blog or, or something of those lines, email distribution lists. You know, when I was in graduate school, every day I kind of would, would kind of send out a, a group email to a lot of friends and family. I had my own little listserv going where I'd kind of write up you know, what was going on in my life and we'd exchange back and forth. But there was one day in, in uh, 2007 where I just got bored doing that, opened up my MacBook and decided to do a, a 30 second video yeah. and put it up on YouTube. And, and that was the first one I did. And uh, I was kind of hooked. So originally yeah. it was basic video blogs, me sitting at the kitchen table. One of my friends, Christopher, always commented, you know, since I was doing it in the kitchen and I had 24 foot ceilings, you know, mm -hmm. he misses the old days of, of the high ceiling Steve videos. But, you know, when I was in Arizona, uh, first starting out, it was, you know, video responses, um, maybe some cooking videos here and there. And that was really it. But when I went to South Korea, since a lot of people at that time were not familiar with South Korea, they still were thinking of it as a uh, mash, the Korean War, weren't familiar with Seoul, the mm. history of it. I started doing a lot more and that's kind of where I found my niche in, in YouTube is was making a lot of history and culture videos about South Korea. And as I started to travel throughout the region more, I would take take the show on the road, so to speak, and and maybe you know maybe do Thailand, maybe do uh, uh, Philippines or Hong Kong or yeah. or other places, and, and just keep on and going with that. And um, that kind of parlayed into you know, news and commentary along the ways as well. Right. So uh, yeah, I mean. The video that just sticks out in my mind uh, from your channel that I always remember is when you were in um, Angkor Wat in Cambodia. Mm. For, for some reason, that, that one 
I always remember that video. I think you that, had the, that the, was the a lot of fun. Yeah. 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 You know, and, you know, and, and that's a bitter, bittersweet, uh, you know, video for me because so the anchor Watt video, I, I was going to start a new series when I got back from vacation called out and about, mm -hmm. and it was going to be, you know, 30 minutes once a month, you know, produce like a, a, a normal TV travel type show. Uh, but anchor wall is, you know, the, the special one. And, you know, we were there for three and a half days and I shot, you know, what, 40 hours of video and there's no way I could condense that down to, to 30 minutes. So we made it, you know, an hour long, it took me two weeks to edit and, mm -hmm. and do the research and narrate it. And I just had a lot of fun doing it. Uh, but that was like one of the last travel videos I did because, I started doing more and more news type stuff and, uh, that became a, a new passion of mine. Right. And, uh, but it was a lot of fun. There's still times I go back and, and, and do that because I, I, you know, I had such a great time filming it, but one of the also reasons why it was bittersweet is I lost my phone at Inter Inker Watt. Uh, oh, right. You know, we, I, I woke up early, saw this beautiful sunrise, was able to film it with the video camera, but yeah. all the still images I had, uh, you know, the, the phone fell out of my pocket as we were going to one of the, the temples on the far, far reaches of the yeah. archaeological park. And I just wasn't able to get it back. So I lost so many pictures and I was just oh, devastated man. by that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I had a similar experience um, in not not in uh, not in Cambodia, but it, just in Los Angeles. Um, I had, I had been v visiting California for a while. Uh, this was years and years ago, but I uh, just lost my camera and lost you know this whole ten day trip that I had. I, some friends and I took a road trip all through the American Southwest and. Everything. Oh, it's um, gut wrenching because um, you have yeah. all those memories. You can see the pictures in your mind, yep. and you want to yep. share them with your family. You want to share them with your friends, yeah. and they're gone. And they're gone. Yeah. And the the place where I thought maybe I lost it kept retracing steps, kept calling, just nothing. So it's uh it's gone forever. Well, you know, I have the I have the memories, and luckily, right. uh, luckily, you know, the two friends I was with, uh, they they had their cameras still, so we were able to salvage some of the some of the photos from there so. that, that reminds me of something a little bit different you know in 2005 i took my brothers up to canyon de Chez and mm -hmm. uh, the four corners area to go see monument valley we did a little bro right. trip right. and my brother had his very first digital camera so we spent the entire day at canyon de Chez, had some great experience out there took some great pictures and we're sitting in the hotel room and he's learning how to use his camera and he goes uh well, what does this format do it pushes format so he formats wow. his sd card so all the pictures that he just took that day were just gone wiped and wiped out like, oh <laughs> wiped it out i was like no yeah. but thankfully we were both there and since you know we'd done the whole trip together we were able to share you know, our pictures with them, but still, yes. you know, it, it's one thing to lose your camera and, and not have any control of it. But when you have control over your images and you're the one that's responsible for losing them, that's, that's bad. And see, I still kick myself for losing my camera because I knew my pocket was a little bit loose, yeah. but, uh, you know, I, I didn't take as many precautions as I should have. And right. I'm, I'm the reason I don't have those pictures anymore. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, you you said your pocket was a bit loose. Um, I, I've heard. Uh, I I haven't been to Cambodia. I've been to Thailand, but uh, I've heard you you have to maybe watch watch your pockets in Cambodia. Some areas of Cambodia, especially the more um, places where a lot of tourists are, is, is that uh, is that something you were also concerned about? Maybe you thought it was was stolen, or did you know it just it just happened to fall out? Oh, oh yeah. Happened a lot. I, I mean, I, I very vividly remember, we, you know, so so to answer your question, whenever I travel, I always try to be safe. So, you know, wallet in the front pocket. And, you know, if, if I even carry a wallet, I usually just carry cash and maybe my credit card and have things where I never have to take cash or things out of my pocket to look at them. I always try to travel very safe. But in this particular yeah. instance, you know, we were on a tuk tuk going to this, you know, other temple and it fell out. I heard it clink. We got our driver to stop, but by then someone had already stopped back and picked it up. Oh, 
So uh, when we got back there, it wasn't there. We were able to call the phone. The person answered. I offered a reward. They weren't really interested in that. And then, you know, turned off the phone. So, oh, uh, I see. So I, I, I know for I, know for, I was actually able to make contact with the person. They just were not interested in, you know, a cash reward for it. So, uh, unfortunately, they thought they could get more money for it on, on the, uh, the the used market, so to speak, than, yeah. than giving it back for, for a nice cash reward. Yeah. I mean, you, you even you couldn't even convince them. Can you at least just trade the uh, the SD card back or, or you know, the... Uh... The storage card, you know. <laughs> the storage card. Yeah, no, no, they were not having any of it. And you yeah. know, you know that it's it's neither here nor there. It's it's mm. what well, that was what twenty thirteen or so, so seven years ago. Um I really don't think about it that much, but uh, you know, always always, you know, travel smart, no matter where you're going, whether it be in the United States, uh or uh in, in other places, there are bad actors everywhere. So yeah, um, you're you're right. You just just, um, just be safe. Yeah, I mean the 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 one time I've I've actually uh, lost my wallet traveling um, was in South Korea. It was uh, 2014, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, the end of 2014, I was visiting Seoul for about six days. About the fourth day, I was um, I was I was with a friend, and we were going to some of the clubs. First club was fine. Um, we we could have actually stayed there and, and been just fine the the rest of the night, but we wanted to check out the rest of the area, and we went to another club that was really packed, mm. uh, shoulder to shoulder. And somewhere along the way, from me entering to getting to the drink bar, my wallet was gone, and I was never able to recover it. Um, I had stupidly, I I had all the cash on me that I had. Oh. In, Oh yeah, um, I had a couple of credit cards, driver's licenses in both in two countries. Like I pretty much lost everything. Luckily, I had my passport at the hotel, so I was still able to get back into Japan uh, from there. But um, and my friend was nice enough to loan me some cash until we got back to Japan. So uh, lesson very well lesson learned after that and, trip and so. see you know south korea is very well known for having a fairly low crime rate and, and being very safe because i have had friends who have lost their wallets only to have it returned you know it falls out on the subway and they go back to the subway it's at the lost and found yeah. there or, or people contact them yeah. uh but you know it's it, it can happen anywhere it can happen, it can happen anywhere so uh, to be honest, uh, I, I thought that too. I thought maybe I just lost it and no one found it, right? Uh, so mm -hmm. I, I went back later to the club and asked if, if anyone had seen it. I described it and they said, well, we'll, we'll look for it. Um, I even went to the uh, the Seoul police station the next morning, mm. even the, the, the headquarters. And um, I, I didn't speak any Korean. Uh, they didn't speak any English, nor I, I said, how about Japanese? They didn't speak any Japanese. I was like, okay, well, not sure what to do here. They, there were only about three police in the entire police headquarters that day. I don't know if that was a rare thing, but because of the lack of communication, they just said, uh, special case, how about you just come back on our computer and enter your own report <laughs> into our system? And I felt, it felt kind of strange. Because I'm like in their office entering my own report into their, you know, into their report. Well, thing. you know, some of these, well, some of these satellite offices that you have in, in, in Korea for the smaller police uh, stations yeah. are, you know, are very interesting. You know, not that kind of incident, but you know, when mm -hmm. I was renewing my my teaching visa in South Korea, they changed yeah. the rules to where. Originally, when I went to Korea, you had to have a police background check, but, you know, a municipal check was OK, but they changed it to a federal check. So I had to get an FBI check. And right. you know, what I had to doing is, is getting my fingerprints. Well, I had to go down to my local police station in the city I was working in right. uh, to get get my fingerprints rolled and put on a card so I could mail it to the FBI. And because that was such a strange request everybody at the police station came out to participate in it and mm -hmm. it was like this big event and they're like this is a special case we want everyone involved because you're the first foreigner who's coming in here who's asked to get their fingerprints you know taken and we want everyone to do it and it became this this huge thing so 
my experience in South Korea is, is that even if there were some, you know, communication um, roadblocks, there were a lot of times where they would find unique solutions to try and meet the needs of everybody, which I always right. appreciated. Yeah, I mean, they, they, it felt um, welcoming, you know, that, that we we both did not know each other's language, and it was it was um, just a lot of gestures and and broken English on on both sides and broken Korean. So, um, but it, it definitely felt like they were trying and they were trying to help. And uh, and and, n- and yeah. nothing ever came about from it. No follow up no. reports. No. Mm, no, I, I followed up. I followed up for about two or three weeks up to a month after that, just checking every day on the, on the lost and found and nothing ever came up. So I chalked it up as a loss. Um, I, I, I think perhaps it was a loss. It wasn't stolen because, um, the hotel I was staying at, I had on one of my credit cards and I told, I, I reported to them immediately. I said, go ahead and charge for my room now because the wallet I'm going to the, report I'm going to report the card stolen so I want the charge to go through before yeah, the bank stops it, it. Exactly. I told them that and they're like okay okay. And it wasn't until I was able to get back to Japan and call to check and I said what what's what's the last charge on the card? And they said uh this this hotel in Korea I said that's me. Is there anything else after that? They said nope. I said okay, cancel it anyway. And uh I canceled my American one as well and um that's why I think maybe it wasn't it stolen. It, yeah, it just fell out somewhere, and and I just lost it because if someone stole it, they would have ran my credit cards. I, I would, or, I would at least try to I, use it. Yeah, at least try to yeah, use it. Right, four or five days. You know that that they they would have tried something, but um, yeah, I just talked it up as a loss and and a and a good lesson not to not to be as. Uh, uh, not well, not by, to carry by, all my cash on me. <laughs> so, not to carry so, all your cash, but I think yeah. another lesson, because I have succumbed to this, is that when you try to be wise and hide your belongings, make sure you actually remember where they were. You know, um, you know, you're wearing a an, an Houston Astros ball cap today, mm-hmm. and yeah. me being in the nation's capital, I had to, you know opportunity to go down to nationals park to see a few games and during the world series not inside the park because the tickets are just too expensive but in and around the park and because of the number of people there i put my wallet in my front pocket because i didn't want it to get pinched and my friends and i are walking back to the subway so we could go home and i instinctively went in my back pocket to grab my wallet to get my metro card and it was gone and i was freaking out and for about five minutes, my friends and I were looking, trying to see, did someone pickpocket me or something? I had totally forgotten that I had the the forbearance to put my wallet in my front pocket, front but I had pocket, totally yeah. forgot about it. And I went through all the stages of panic that oh, my yeah. wallet had been been lifted. Um, but I was I was you know trying to be responsible. I was responsible. I just forgotten that I had been responsible. Uh, so, <laughs> so I, and I, and I've, I've done that too with my passport. I, I, I put my passport in a different place because I, I wanted to keep it safe. And then when I needed my passport, I f- totally forgot about it. This is in the United States. So it wasn't when I was traveling, but I completely forgot where it was. And I had to order a brand new uh, passport and report the previous one lost because right. I was so good at securing its location hiding, that yeah. I didn't remember where it was. <laughs> so then you got to have a reminder of, uh, of, of your secure spot. <laughs> some kind of, so, some did, kind of did, post it. Yeah. Did you eventually find the passport later at all? Oh yeah. Like, a, like, like yeah. a year later I was moving yeah. some stuff around. What had happened is I had fallen into my swimming pool and my passport was wet and was curling up, so I had put it under wow. something to flatten it out and totally <laughs> forgot that that's what I had done until yeah. I was moving some stuff around on the shelves. Like, oh, well, here's my passport. Yeah, that, 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 that you just kind of feel like, oh, yeah, gotta gotta slap yourself for that. <laughs> but and, and um, when you do it at the time, it's like, oh, of course, I'll remember where this is, <laughs> and right. then no. No, famous last don't. words. Famous, famous last, last words. words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, going back to your your wallet story being in your front pocket, I mean, the the sense of relief you you must have felt when you actually remembered. Oh, it's it's here. It's right well, here. Well, it's a sense of relief, but also a sense of stupidity because it's like, come on, you know, 
in, in the span of what, 15, 20 minutes, I totally forgot that I had done that. Um, yeah. but, uh, you know, yeah, I was very, very relieved it was that. And, you know, got some good, good ribbing from my friends of, of having to put everyone through that for, for the short amount of time that, that we were all searching frantically for it. Right. Right. But that's, no. that, yeah, that's, yeah, when you when you when you find something that you thought you had lost, or even if you did lose it and you find it again, that's that's uh that's a great feeling. It, it is, it is. And um, you know, like you said about East Asia, you especially um in Japan as well, um, if you lose something, more likely than not, you will get it back intact. Uh I was in Tokyo years ago at a um a restaurant, set my bag down with all everything I had in it, uh, just to the side. And when I finished, I forgot that I'd set my bag just down on the floor, left, had a, went on a train, was all, you know, halfway across the city when I remembered, Oh, Oh, I, I don't have my bag. So I, I, I had to search, I had my phone, but I searched the restaurant, called the number and I said, look, I left my bag. It looks like this. They said, Oh yeah, we have it. Come back and get it. I went back. Everything was fine. And one of my colleagues, the same thing in in South Korea. We had left the after school academy, went to a restaurant for a few drinks after work. She had a laptop bag. We got up, walked to school, uh, walked back home rather that night. And she realized that she didn't have her laptop. The next day, the owners had found it. You know, it was right where we were sitting. They they kept it safe for her. It was it was it was wonderful. But that, but not even like things that you lose. I mean, same thing in Tokyo, right? You you go into a coffee shop. You want to save your table when you go up to the restroom or or go to the counter. You can leave your laptop. You yep. can leave your phone. Everything you want on the table. It will not get touched. That's but right. I would I would never even think about doing that here in the United States. Oh no no no. And that that's just it. You live long enough. In East Asia, you get complacent in a way, and you you'll it, you got to be careful not to forget when you are back in the mm-hmm. West or uh, you know the United States that you're not in Asia anymore. You can't just leave your belongings just sitting there, or else uh, more likely they will than get not, pinched. Yeah. They they will get pinched. Yeah, so uh, that's big benefit living out here is um, just people were just in general more respectful for others' property. Um, in Japan, it seems to be for everything except for umbrellas and bicycles. Those are the two things people tend to uh, lose That's the most. That's fascinating. That's fascinating. Yeah. I yeah. would always just lose my umbrella in, in South Korea because I never really paid that much attention to it because I'd always get the the, the one, two, or three dollar variety. And right. if I forgot it at a place, it just wasn't worth me picking something else. You know, mm. going back to retrieve it, I just go into the next convenience store and and buy a new one. Buy a new one. Yeah, um, I, I think in a lot of ways, uh, sometimes umbrellas, the the cheap umbrellas here are mm-hmm. considered sort of uh, uh, like communal property. Sometimes, so like mm. you, you have like this big um, um, umbrella rack i guess i don't I'm, I'm, i gotcha you. you know what i mean uh, outside of a convenience store you you put yours there they all kind of look very similar right if someone mm-hmm. takes yours um you're it's expected you're more than free just to take take one and then you you leave it somewhere else and for someone else to have you know so um i'm not sure if that's uh if that's just an un, unspoken thing but i i've i've noticed that a lot people will just come uh, you know leave theirs or take take one later or whatever so uh, different if they're higher priced umbrellas you know that they're very distinctive um mm-hmm. those you don't want to have that's fascinating stuff yeah yeah now bicycles on the other hand those that's that's one uh thing that's frustrating no matter what like that's um i've never had mine stolen but i've i've known a lot See, of I can't I can't bring stuff. myself to buy a bicycle. Uh, you know, when I was in high school, that's how I got to and from in my home, sometimes even right. work. I'd ride my bike and, and do that. And I went to Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff, Arizona, and certainly when it, it snowed, you couldn't ride your bike. But during you know most of the fall term and the latter half of the spring term, you know, the weather was fantastic, and it was a you know two mile long campus. And so being able to ride your bike to class certainly allowed you to get there faster and more conveniently. 
But twice within the very first semester I was there, my bike got stolen. Wow. And ever since then, I was like, I, I am not. And these were cheap bikes. These were, you know, $99, $125 bikes. They just were, were cheap throwaways. And I, I just couldn't justify buying another bicycle because they just were going to get stolen again. And, right. and and to this day, I have this memory of, of mm. my bikes being stolen and I just I just can't do it. Right. And and and, the, and I had friends in Korea who who their bikes weren't stolen, but their bicycle seats were stolen. The which seats. I thought interesting. The seats. Huh. Now, when I visited, I that's one thing that was very stark contrast from Japan for me was I didn't see as many bicycles in Seoul as I you would in let's say Tokyo. You know, mm -hmm. um, there were more people riding. Are driving cars or riding motorbikes, and very very few bicycles that, that I saw for my short time that I was there. No, Did I you... would say it's very very accurate. Uh, you know, in in the cities and whatnot, in in, in Seoul especially, uh, and even like I lived in a satellite city about thirty kilometers south of Seoul, and there were not that many bikes on the main roads. If you're going to ride a bike, you would ride it on a proper path. Uh, so in Seoul, on either side of the Han River, there's beautiful walking and running and bicycling paths. And there are a lot of people who, you know, will, will take advantage uh, of renting a bicycle if they don't have one or bringing their bike down and riding up and down that. Uh, in the cities I lived in, there were also walking, running and biking paths and, and people would ride their bikes there. But in the city itself, because of the amount of uh, vehicle traffic on the roads, uh, it, it was, you know, from my perspective, you know, very nerve wracking. I would not want to mm. be oh, yeah. <laughs> on, on a bike, bike in that environment. And I think in Seoul, especially since the roads are, you know, the, the main roads of course are six, sometimes lanes wide, but on some of the other roads, you just don't have enough space. And uh, even scooters are, are precarious when they go through. That's why so many you know scooters ride on the sidewalks, which is a whole other issue. Yeah, yeah, I, I noticed that too. Um, I, Like I said, did, I was only there for a very short time, but um, the every time there was a, a crosswalk that I was, you know, a green green crosswalk for me to cross, um, that didn't necessarily mean the cars would stop. Uh, I, I noticed a lot of people running red lights uh, mm. in the area I was at. Is that a common thing, or was this just a, a rare occurrence? I know. So I mean, I, and, I've, and I've had buses run red lights too. You know, they're yeah. very much on the schedule, and, and they would run red lights, which just freaked me out as, as a passenger on the bus. It's like, no, that's mm. that's that's going there. Um, I, I, you know, I'd see cars run red lights, but on the same side, I'd see pedestrians not pay attention to the crossing indicators as well. And right. hey, you know, they want to cross the street, and uh, you know, it, it may be a do not walk signal, but I think I can beat the car, so I'm going to run out and 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 you know, essentially jaywalk. Uh, yeah, so it was it was on play, both sides. Play a game of Frogger, right? So mm. um, I noticed that much more in in Thailand. Uh, you would just have to walk out into traffic and just hope that they would stop for you, you know. And first time a friend of mine did that, we were in Chiang Mai, and uh, they said, I, I, I was waiting for the crosswalk signal to turn. They're like, man, you're better just off just walking out into traffic, holding your hand out, and just going. I said, really? He goes, watch. And we, we all started walking across the street and I thought, man, for sure we're going to get hit by a car. And sure. No, not all the cars just slowed down. They didn't even stop. I, they just slowed down, let us go. And then they, they kept going, you know? So well, one of the things I heard, I can't remember what country it was. It was, it was, you know, a Southeast Asian country It's a very similar experience. And, and the recommendation was, you know, if you're waiting for a time to cross, you'll probably never find the ideal time. So the recommendation is be aware of your surroundings and then step out into the street and walk consistently. Don't try to uh, speed up or slow down because the drivers will see you there. They'll see your course. They'll see your speed and plan accordingly to allow uh. you to cross safely. And that took 
that took a lot to get used to when I was traveling around because yeah. that is not intuitive. It's like you see a car come and you want to kind of, you know, pick up the pace a little bit and, and get across as, as soon as soon as and safely as possible. That that might be Vietnam. I've heard that about Vietnam as well. Maybe that may have been Vietnam. I was I was just in Vietnam. That was the you know, when I went to South Korea to be there for seven months on, on an interim basis. Uh, I was on a short term reporter visa. So every 90 days I had to leave the country to, uh, uh, you know, essentially renew the clock uh, to come back in. And so I went to Japan and was able to do the uh, the Santa run through Tokyo. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. In December. yeah. I had friends who and did that, that last year. Yeah. That, that yeah. was a lot of fun. And then the, the second trip was uh, to Hanoi. And that that was that was a uh, a fun experience to to do a nice little weekend trip out there to right. to, to to see Vietnam to have some good food some great coffee and uh, enjoy some nice weather. Right, right, yeah. Um, that's still that's on my uh, my Southeast Asia bucket list as well as Vietnam. So um, now you lived in in South Korea, but out of all the countries that you visited in Asia. Which one was uh, your favorite? Uh, see, that's tough um, yeah. because each one had had different things. I, I enjoyed traveling extensively throughout South Korea because of the transportation network and how affordable everything was. You know, go out to the the coastal cities, go up to the mountains. You know, your hotels were relatively cheap. Getting there by train or bus was cheap. Um, which was fantastic. I was traveling through Southeast Asia. Uh, I really enjoyed Hong Kong uh, mm. from the food aspect. Uh, you know, being being I'm six four, as and I don't have a you know large feet. I wear like a size twelve, but that is really at the fringe of buying footwear in South Korea. So I could always find footwear, but my my options were severely limited. So mm. going to Hong Kong and being able to buy, you know, whatever I wanted in terms of shoes and boots and was, it was just, you know, fantastic. Um, I really enjoyed going to the Philippines for scuba diving. Um, yep. it was always one of my favorite places. Um, yeah, you know, I, I have friends that live in Thailand have made that their home after they left South Korea to go teach. I've, uh, and went and visited them. I thought that was fantastic. I enjoyed going to the temples and, and going to the beaches mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. uh, so I really don't have a favorite. I think I think the thing I was always grateful for was having the opportunity to travel and just seeing something new. And that's what I really really liked. Uh, yeah. And it, you know, ha having having the 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 ability to to do something. And just constantly check things off my bucket list. Yeah, yeah, and that's what's what's cool about being in uh, East Asia is uh, a lot of these places are very easily accessible um, for travel. So mm -hmm. um, I'm a little bit disappointed this year. Any travel plans I had were uh, canceled um, so far. Yeah, so. you know, my brother, my younger brother, is getting married in September, and yeah. I. I'm I'm a hopeful that you know his wedding will be on on time and and we'll be able to travel out to Hawaii to to be able to do that. But I have had friends already who have scrapped their nuptials or who are doing it virtually online and, and doing a massive video conference to do their wedding, and that's how they're having to do it because you know you just can't travel right now. Yeah, I mean even. Well, even domestic, domestically in America, right? The travel is very limited. Is that? Am I, am well, I wrong on that? Or well, no, you're you're not wrong on that. I mean, because of all the stay-at-home orders, you know, mm -hmm. essential flights are still going on. But uh, by some accounts, you know, a lot of the routes are just being cut because no one, no one's traveling. No and one's if you look traveling. at the international flights, I mean, uh, you know, the Seoul Embassy. You know, I got notified overnight because I'm still on their emailing list that, mm. you know, the international in South Korea and the United States, they're written ready to suspend that. So they're warning all Americans in South Korea to if you want to be back in the U.S., you need to make your plans right now while there are international flights, because soon there will yeah. not be. And the State Department is not planning any repatriation flights. So, uh, you know, who knows 
what impact uh, this is going to have on the international air travel uh, moving forward. And even domestically, if you look at you know, some of the airlines here in the United States, they have laid off thousands upon thousands of people because, you know, they just they just don't have the flights. They, they're just not there. And it's going to be interesting to see what happens with the airports as well, because, you know, that since there are fewer flights, the, the airplanes aren't, you know, making their, uh, um, you know, landing percentages, so they could risk losing landing privileges at at airports, uh, depending on if they become less lax on the rules as as they're currently written, which I'm, I'm sure the airline industry is hoping for. Um, but there was a video I, I, I was perusing the news this morning, and there was mm. a video uh, posted that there was an individual. He was the only person on a flight. He had the really? entire plane to himself and just yeah. showed you how, how, you know, few people are traveling these days. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'd, uh, I'd seen something where someone took a picture inside a flight and there were maybe two people in the, mm-hmm. in the entire flight, but yeah, uh, the, they issued the same warning, um, to Americans in Japan too. Uh, they said, unless you want to be in Japan indefinitely, better make your arrangements now. And, uh, yeah, you know, for me, I I live and work here, so I'm like, well, that doesn't really apply. But it's it's still quite jarring to kind of see that warning, you know, mm-hmm. come out to everybody. So um, I, I think Japan uh, has pretty much banned um, all, n- not every country, but pretty much every country uh, of a- any sort of uh, international. Um, uh, travel to Japan from other countries, uh, definitely mm-hmm. America, Europe, and China and South Korea. But I think 67 other countries are included on that list as well. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, uh, uh, but in terms of domestic travel, the, you know, every everything's still going as planned. So uh, the, the only thing they've really done is just urge people to not go out on weekends or, or out at night to bars and restaurants and clubs and stuff uh but everything else has been pretty much at business as usual um mm. it, now if you, if you look at you know pictures of, of tokyo the past two weekends um shibuya scramble you know the, the crossing and everything very very few people compared to what it usually is so but, people yeah, are the big scramble as it normally is yeah well yeah. i mean look i mean even look at hanami right i mean that's that was pretty much you know, not canceled, but you did not have the scores of people that you normally have go out no. to the parks for the cherry blossoms. No. Um, I mean, I live right next to, you know, the largest park in, in Utsunomiya. And uh, I went just there today just to, because, you know, it was the first nice weather day we've had on a weekend in a while. And while there weren't, there definitely were not as many people. None of the uh, the food booths were open uh, mm. But there were, you know, small groups of, you know, individual families or couples, you know, and everyone kind of kept a little bit of distance. So that while there were a lot of people there, they all were practicing a lot of distancing. So it's uh, it is it well, is good. on the it, yeah it, it is on people's minds at least. So well, see that was the thing here because you know here here in in DC we have the tidal basin which has all the the cherry blossoms that were donated yeah. by you know Japan, and you know. Right up until the social distancing really became more of a mandatory thing versus a recommendation, there were fewer people out at the tidal basin looking at them, and people were trying to do you know six feet apart, but you know a lot of times they just simply weren't. But you know the the DC metro area actually came out and said, "Hey, because of COVID-19, because of social distancing guidelines, we're actually going to cut service to the two different subway stops that are closest to the tidal basin to try and minimize the number of people going to the tidal basin to see the cherry blossoms because right. we, we just don't want to contribute to that. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, it, it's, it's good, you know, just keeping people away from from these large gatherings mm-hmm. right now um now there there are still instances where people don't follow it um this was a couple of weeks ago but when the olympic torch had arrived in japan i think like ten thousand people gathered in one spot mm. and yeah and 
this was well after this was like right when it was starting to pick up in the U.S. and and uh, a lot of people here were just like, "Are are you guys crazy? What are you doing? You know, like this is this this isn't over." So, uh, you know, a lot of people commended Japan for early on. They they closed schools here, um, right early. For, for, yeah, pretty early. And uh, at the end of February, they said, "Okay, all of March, pretty much, no no mm-hmm. schools." And everyone thought, "Oh, that either." Why? I mean, it's not that it's not that big of a deal. And then it did slow down a lot in Japan. Like the the cases were not going up, but then it started taking off everywhere else. And I think people here got a little too complacent and said, "Ah, it's over with." But they were going about business as usual, and it seems like a second wave has now hit, and the cases are exploding. So Mm. um, it's a it's day by day we're seeing what's going to happen with with this at the moment. So, yeah. But um, so going back to uh, your time in 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 South Korea. So you you were teaching, you were doing YouTube, but then you started mm-hmm. getting into radio, right? Or yeah. So radio. I mean, well, well, podcast and radio. So actually, in I would say 2010, I started doing some uh, radio with uh, some of the English language stations out there. And then in 2011, I started becoming weekly guests on various different radio shows, and that kind of also morphed into TV appearances as well. And I really was doing that up up until I left. I always was a a guest on on some morning show, uh, talking about travel, talking about culture, talking about something, and just had a really great time doing that. Uh, but with the succession of power in North Korea back in 20, I guess it was 2013 when Kim Jong-un came to power, uh, yeah. that's, that's when I started doing more news because I kept on getting a lot of questions. There was certainly an uptick in the tension in the uh, East Asia area. And I you know, started going on, on the BBC and, and different programs. And that kind of led me to, uh, I'd already had a podcast where I kind of focused on a little bit of, of East Asia news, but yeah. you know, I, I got more and more questions to, uh, you know, as far as big, big picture type stuff going across, uh, East Asia and Southeast Asia as well. So I started doing that more often and that really became more of a full-time side hustle, side gig, uh, rather than just doing the YouTube videos. Uh, so I started doing that and I really enjoyed it and that kind of parlayed into another career. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you, you originally focused on, um, news in East Asia, right? So, uh, Mm -hmm. the, as you said, the big big thing at the time was really just Kim Jong Un, North Korea, right? So, and I'm sure you've you've kept your finger on the button for, for so to speak, uh, in, so to speak, that, right? Yeah, in the on that one as well, because seems he's he's still um, he still wants people to pay attention to him because uh, especially now the news is focusing on this virus, uh, the the amount of missiles he's he's launching uh just here recently is is gone up a lot as well so well i mean uh, a fair number i mean i think i think it's what four four different uh multiple mm-hmm. missile ro- lo- ro- uh, rocket launcher tests or, or whatever mm-hmm. in, in the last few months uh you know he had notoriously put out the end of year deadline for resumption of talks between the u.s and pyongyang uh and and 2019 that didn't really amount to anything and you know most of the analysts i speak to on a regular basis for north korean commentary you know they were very skeptical as, as to what kim jong un's um you know motives were in terms of how serious he was about denuclearization and you know famously you always had the discussion as what does denuclearization mean to north korea versus the united states and the international community and you know, it is it's just a play to try and, and get sanctions lifted and and things kind of, you know, played out as as they have always done uh, with North Korea over time. But uh, I think you're very right that that the world is is, is very focused on COVID-19 and not on, on North Korea right now as it tries to you know, grapple with its own situation there. It, it still says that there are no cases of COVID-19 up in North Korea, but 500 or so people appear to be detained to try to, 
limit that there. So uh, who knows what's going to happen there since I guess also uh, there's going to be some humanitarian aid delivered to North Korea to kind of help out with them as well. But uh, yeah. Do you now? Do you think, uh, like, especially with Donald Trump meeting with Kim Jong Un and being the first, I, I believe, the first uh, U.S. president to step into North Korean territory? Like, did you have any sort of, um, how? What did you first think of the the initial meetings? Their their first sort of uh, um, verbal spat that they had before they met, and then their sort of semi budding friendship after they met and then the kind well, of it was certainly, of it was certainly and, you know. interesting to watch it was certainly interesting yeah. to watch because i mean and, and you can't really watch you can't really i don't think you can put this in perspective of just the the donald trump presidency you have to you know keep in mind the moon presidency as, as well because he right. was the one that really made that olive branch out first and and you know really put his presidency on the line so to speak in many ways because of the economic ta- uh benefit he wanted to have with North Korea with these inter-Korean projects that have kind of fizzled uh because the sanctions were never list- listed uh lifted rather uh you know so you you have all these things and you know a lot of analysts were like hey you know things have been the status quo for for a number of years, nothing's going to change. North Korea doesn't appear to be wanting to change. So, you know, Moon and and Trump trying to do something to move the needle that warrants some, you know, respect and, and, and some kudos in, in terms of trying something new. A lot of the analysts I spoke to thought that, you know, both were being a little on the naive side, thinking that North Korea and Kim Jong-un were completely transparent in every aspect of what they were doing. And many thought that what they were offering in terms of giving up, so to speak, were not that significant because they had so many other resources. So if you talk about the Yongbyon nuclear testing plant, that's one that's one that's well known, but by all you know, assessments by the intelligence community and other analysts, they have many others. So if you give up the one that you know about, and you still have the other ones, is it really a meaningful gesture? Um, So, I mean, it was interesting to watch back and forth. Um, I think most analysts really came out and said, hey, it's a worthwhile effort to see if something can be done, but they really didn't expect anything to uh, uh, change. And I think even going back to right with, with Abe going trying to have better relationships with North Korea a number of years ago, right? You know, lifting a temporary lifting of the sanctions between Japan and North Korea as they looked into the abductees. And Mm -hmm. then a year goes by, nothing comes from that, and then the sanctions go back. So, you know, what was was Abe naive in in terms of of trying to get something from North Korea that was very important for for him politically and for many in Japan in terms of what happened to what they say are what almost a thousand abductees over the years. Uh, You know, North Korea, North Korea was able to get sanctions lifted for a year and it's beneficial for them. So uh, I I think many analysts kind of saw the same type of thing going on between the two countries there. So you're you're. In your opinion, you you pretty much believe that uh, North Korea is just going to do what they're going to do for their own benefit, and they they have no interest in in really playing ball with uh, with the rest of the world. Uh, it, 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 when when you say playing ball, it, it really yeah. depends on what you mean. I mean, when when you speak to different analysts, they they know what North Korea wants. They they want to be an even player on the international stage. They don't want sanctions. Rem- they want they don't want any sanctions on them. They want all the sanctions removed. That's the end game for for North Korea. They want the regime to be protected protected. So you have this diametrically opposed position. You want you have on one hand the international community that doesn't want North Korea to get nuclear weapons that is coming from the standpoint, hey, um, you need to give up everything and then we'll talk about sanction relief. And then on the other side of the coin, you have North Korea saying, well, you know what, we want everything given up first and then we'll we'll move forward. 
Well, you know, we talked about trust building during all the talks between North Korea and the United States. And, you know, North Korea doesn't have a, a great track record with following through on, on pledges. They're still very adept at, at skirting skank sanctions now. Uh, so, so the trust just isn't there. And, you know, you had China and Russia trying to be the brokers of, of a step-by-step -step process, um, you know, and even analysts talking about instead of uh, denuclearization, uh, arms management instead, because North Korea, they feel, is not going to give up its nuclear weapons. So, uh, right. you know, North, North Korea has successfully been able to keep up its weapons programs, even under sanctions. And don't forget, they were able to put a satellite in into space before South Korea was. And that was done under sanctions through the mechanisms that they have in place to skirt them. So uh, they're, they're very adept. And, you know, analysts will, have told me several times they have not seen anything in North Korea's actions that show uh, a change in behavior uh, in the past or, or moving forward. Right, right. Yeah, it's, it's definitely interesting because um, Kim Jong-un is, is still quite young. So... Um, as long as he doesn't eat himself to death, uh, he uh, he seems to be one to stick around for a while, you know. So. Well, he he has done a a good job of, of shoring up his his control in the country, and that that seems to be uh, one of his plans for longevity there. Right, right. Um, it's just always funny. I, I remember before he even uh, took power, um, there were you know there was talks of him being the successor to Kim Jong-il and at the time they were saying uh, you know he he went he studied abroad right was it Switzerland mm -hmm. he, he, I yeah, believe Switzerland. so yes yeah and there, there was a, the school photo of him with the with his class and and uh, you know he's a big fan of, of, of the NBA and, and a, f a friend of Dennis Rodman and you know there's all mm -hmm. these like quirky things about this guy that are sort of humanizing to him but then he's you know the 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 dictator, or you know of of uh, pro probably the most one of the most oppressive regimes in the world. So you kind of it's um, kind of have a, a, a double double sort of uh, feeling about about the guy, you know. So yeah, but people are people, regardless. So <laughs> so so uh, getting back to to more of your um, what what you're doing now. So how did you transition from you said you were doing more radio programs in South Korea, and that kind of mm -hmm. developed into a uh, like a second career. How did? What, tell me about the 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 journey from ending your your life in South Korea to moving back to the states and and starting your your new career here or in uh, in the states. In the states, uh, yeah. So yeah. what happened is is that at, I'd always planned the moving back to the United States at some point. Right. I didn't know when, but uh, at some point I knew I wanted to come back to uh, the United States since my family's here and I want to spend time with them. And, and as much as I enjoy traveling around Asia, I love the U.S. national parks and I miss mm -hmm. those grand vistas and, and open spaces. Yeah. So I wanted to come back to that rather than just on, on short trips between semesters, so to speak. So, um, you know, I had the podcast going on on Asia Pacific geopolitics, and I had seen a job opening at Voice of America, uh, you know, producing radio and television content. And I applied for that, thinking that with the uh, speed of the U.S. government, it would be months and months before they would get around to hiring. And uh, I came out to the D.C. area for uh, the holidays to see my brothers, see my family. And by chance, I was meeting with some uh, people who I'd met online through Twitter and, and through Facebook at, at VOA. And this was when they were actually conducting interviews for the position. And I happened to be in the right place at the right time. They, they liked the podcast. They liked what I had to offer. And they uh, did an interview for the position, and I got the job. Oh. And that's how I made the trans transition from Asia back to the U.S. It was, it was one of those accident, happy accidents, and been here ever since. Great, and you've been uh, you've been enjoying it since then. I really have. I, I've done a lot of different things here. I've got to produce a uh, uh, produce an anchor uh, TV news program. 
and different other uh, feature type programs. And then now I, I get to anchor my own uh, radio show every day. Well, that's great. And um, uh, once again, how how can people listen to that? Is it only through terrestrial radio or can they listen to it online as well? Well, they can actually listen to it online. Yeah. So uh, the Voice of America does not broadcast domestically in the United okay. States. It's an outward international broadcaster. And we have affiliates all around the world. Uh, you know, the largest affiliate market is in Africa. Uh, but uh, in addition to finding affiliate stations wherever you may be, uh, everything is available online at voanews.com. And, you know, like I said, the uh, you know, my, my radio program is called International Edition, and it's at uh, 15, sorry, 1705 UTC Universal Time, uh, you know, Monday through Friday. And, you know, you can find it on, on the website, or you can actually find it wherever you get your podcast as well, because it's, it's okay. uh, downloadable that way, too. Okay, cool, cool. And now, um, you, you had the podcast for, for a long time. Um, you enjoyed that. So is this what you're doing now? Um, how different is it than kind of producing your own uh, podcast? Uh, what 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 exactly goes into your 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 day in preparing for this and then going on air? Oh uh, yeah, that's a great question. So um, for for me personally, it's not all that different. So producing a podcast, uh, especially a news podcast, you know, is always trying to find stories that are relevant and finding and booking guests and then conducting interviews and then, uh, you know, cutting those interviews for broadcast. You know, the, the big difference is with a podcast, you know, you can kind of kind of have an idea of how long you want each show to be. But if it goes longer than that, hey, that's OK. If it goes shorter than that, eh, that's OK as well. Um, right. You know, and ideally, every, if you have a podcast or, or some other video series, you want to have that, that that firm every episode is going to drop at, at such and such a time on such and such a day. You know, with a radio program, you're very much deadline driven. You know, every day, Monday through Friday at 1705 UTC, the red light turns on, the theme music comes on and I have to be ready to go. I have, you know, 25 minutes uh, of show to fill and I have to do it new and fresh every single day. Right. Um, you know, in uh, on the personal side, you know, doing a podcast that's your own personal thing. If you choose to editorialize, you can do that. You know, working for a news organization, you know, you don't do that. You're a journalist. You're a reporter. You you follow the two source rule. You don't let your own opinions interject into your reporting. You do things from a neutral and unbiased perspective. And in fact, by law, Voice of America is is set up that way. Is that you know we are unbiased. We we have to have you know two sources for everything, and we are objective in every sense of the, of the term. Uh, okay. But you know, do, doing live radio is a lot of fun. You know, yeah. uh, you 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 put your stories together. You got to make sure that all your timing is down. And, and that's just the way it is. You're in the studio, you can have guests on the phone and, you know, sometimes your, your guests like to talk and, and they're eating up time later, later on the program and you have to do some really fancy math really quick to retime everything to make sure that you end out on time. Now, right. that being said with the coronavirus, we are remote working. Um, I produce my radio show every single day from home, from my desk right here. So in many ways it is just like doing the podcast back Back in days of long ago, where yeah. I get I get all my stories, I do all my reporting, and then I sit with my microphone and I edit in my uh, audio editing program and, and put it together and, and send it off to my production team to go out and and get it ready for the affiliates. So wow. in, in that yeah. respect, it really hasn't. You know, it, it's all the skills that I learned while doing the podcast are perfectly relevant to what I do on a day to day basis now. Well, that's 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 cool. Uh, you you just um, were able to to build those skills on your own, and then come back and and, and use them in in this scenario. You know, so yeah, um, yeah, and, and and thankfully, since I have those, I actually get to help you know my my colleagues who who are used to the broadcast environment, who are used to doing things live and not having to pre-produce uh, as heavily of shows as as they had to do in the past. Yeah, so I was going to ask actually um, how this. Um, how this, you know, the COVID-19 has, has really affected your line of work. Um, you know, you've mentioned that you're doing remote work now, but um, ha how else has it impacted your life other than pretty much you're, you're kind of homebound at this point, right? 
Yeah, I mean, we have stay-at-home orders here in Virginia, and so I'm abiding by those. Uh, but right. other than that, you know, it you know it really hasn't. I'm thankfully I'm able to do the shows that I like to do in terms of uh, a wide variety of either correspondent reports from people that are either stringers for VOA or correspondents filing radio uh, packages for us, and, and and me doing interviews with experts from around the world. Uh, in, in many ways, it's easier for me to do the show here uh, because at the office. Because I was doing the podcast, I had all the recording equipment to to where no matter what digital platform my guest was on, I had a way to communicate with them. Uh, you know, at the office, you know, uh, I'm not using as many different tools. I still have them all access, but uh, it takes a little bit more for jerry rigging to to get things done that way. But you know, it's for for me, it's 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 great. I I love doing it and. You know, I, I, I'm very happy I invested in the equipment I did back in, in South Korea to right. do shows I was doing back then because I'm able to do things here. And because I've had years of experience putting together these kinds of shows, when my colleagues run into some hiccups, let's say, some some road bumps, you know, they, they're able to contact me and I'm able to walk them through things and, and some interesting, um, easier way of, of doing things. Uh, to get the same results than than going or the the long road around trying to get the same results. Yeah, yeah. So that's good. That's good that uh, you're you're actually, you know, uh, getting through this and and, and actually able to uh, to help out as well. You know, in that. So when when this is all uh, over with, when when life seems to be getting back to normal, what's the first thing you want to do? Well, the first thing I want to do is actually be able to go to the gym. You know, I, yeah. well, I love to run and not yeah. being able to really go on long runs or, um, you know, it does get hot here in, in the Northern Virginia area, the DMV, as we like to call it, the district, Maryland and Virginia area, you know, it gets hot here. So you, then you have to go down to, you know, the gym and, and jump on a treadmill. Yeah. I just want to be able to do that. You know, put yeah. my podcast into my ears, get on and go for a run. That's what I'm missing. You know, you know, from from a personal perspective, from a work perspective, as easy it is for me to do the show from home, I miss interacting with my colleagues. Uh, right. You know, we all work on different programs. We have a morning editorial meeting every single day. So we kind of go down what's on the show every single day for all of us, um, you know, with so many different types of stories related to COVID-19. Most of our shows are always, you know, revolving around that with different health updates, different economic updates, different humanitarian updates. Um, and, and there are other stories going on that, that we fit in as well. But I truly enjoyed the morning editorial meeting, sitting down with my colleagues and learning about what's going on with their particular reporting focus to help me keep uh, more informed and better informed uh, about the world. And I, I miss, I truly miss that because since we're doing things remotely now and, and there's such a push to get content done early so that if there are any technical hiccups as, as it gets closer to, you know, broadcast time, there's mm. ample time to, to deal with that, you know, the higher ups have their meetings, but you know the 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 anchors aren't a part of them anymore. Right. We have we have more of a one on one type meeting than than the group meeting that we used to have. Uh, but I, I miss that. I, I truly miss that interaction, and that's the one thing I hear consistently throughout. You know, all all my colleagues that I communicate with either through chat or through video chat is we really miss the camaraderie that we mm. had in the newsroom. Right, right. Yeah, I'm sure that the human interaction is a lot, is a lot. Uh, people don't realize what they have until you know it's just suddenly taken away in in many right. aspects. You know, so um, it's a uh, it's a strange time. So uh, hopefully, life will return to normal uh, pretty soon. You know, so absolutely, uh, now, absolutely. Now, Virginia, I, I heard Virginia is scheduled to be. The what was it? Uh, shelter in place until June? Now is it? Or June. Is it... June. June is the wow. order. Uh, we had that uh, come out earlier <clears throat> this week. Uh, they you know really followed in tandem with the the governor of Maryland issuing and and really the the mayor of D.C. issuing. So all all three 
the area we issued shelter in place stay at home orders uh to june till the end of april wow wow that's uh that's that that's much later than you know the rest of the country it seems um it's usually just to the end of uh to the beginning of may or or so but um and that could always be, you know, changed as well. But I think they're just looking at worst case scenario based on the, you know, the the projections. Uh, so who knows how long it will actually be? Yeah, yeah. It's just uh, it changes day by day because, you know, like we said, just a few weeks ago, it was completely opposite. And no one mm-hmm. I wouldn't say they weren't taking it seriously, but uh, people didn't expect it to be in the current state that it's in now. So, right. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, Steve, I uh, appreciate you coming on. Um, is there uh, is there anything you would like to tell the audience? Uh, anything at all? Any words of wisdom or any advice or just anything anything you would like to share? I don't know if I have any words of wisdom or advice. I mean, I guess the thing is, it's been an absolute pleasure to to come on here, and I never for once thought I'd be in the position where I am now, you know, hosting radio programs, um, or, or or thinking, or thinking that my little foray into YouTube and podcasting would amount to much. Um, you know, I think it just goes to show you that if you have whatever passions you have in life, you know, enjoy them, embrace them. And it's not so much whether or not they, they turn into something that is financial rewarding. The important thing is that they are rewarding to you. Um, yeah. you know, pe- pe- people, ba- people back in the day asked me, you know, why did I create YouTube videos? And the answer was I was having fun doing them and that's why I did them. And then, you know, I would stop doing them when they weren't fun anymore. And, you know, I was very fortunate to have the opportunities I have, you know, come about from those, um, forays into YouTube and, and to podcasting. But, you know, even if this didn't happen, I just had a great time doing it and, you know, have fun. Life is too short not to have fun. So, you know, yeah. follow your passions, follow your dreams and, you know, understand that they may not be the the career path you want to, but doesn't mean you have to you know give them up. That's true. That's true. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, one last time, where can people find you uh, online, uh, any social media? And of course, uh, where can people find you, uh, find find your show and your YouTube channel as well? Well, I really don't do YouTube anymore, so that's kind of kind of off there. But if they want right. to listen to the international news, uh, you can find us over at uh, voanews.com and look under the live radio and program tabs. Uh, or you can just look for International Edition on any podcast uh, feeder that you have, and you'll be able to find our program there. Uh, as okay. far as social media, I really don't do it anymore. So, uh, okay. yeah, well, uh, I, 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 a little little uh, less uh, active online than I used to be, and I, I'm, I'm very fortunate to have you know that kind of free time now. I, I was going to say that might you might be uh, might have made the right choice in that respect. So, um, okay, Steve. Well, I appreciate it, and. Uh, we uh, we'd l- love to have you back on again sometime. Sure. So, yeah. Well, thank you very much, Jay. I really appreciate it. All right. Thank you.